Welcome and thank you for joining us today for the Precision Dairy Farming from Hoves to Harvest webinar series. This project is brought to you by the UVM Extension Northwest Crops and Soils team and is sponsored by the Vermont Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets. We have a great lineup of speakers joining us over the next couple of weeks from all over the country and also some local experts. And we will be digging into a variety of topics, exploring technologies available to dairy producers. We have started the series this week, hearing about some of the more cow side technologies and tools and are moving into exploring technologies used in the field. You can use the same Zoom link that was provided to you when you registered to access all of the sessions and all of the sessions are being recorded and will be posted to the Northwest Crops and Soils Program website under the conference tab, conference and events tab. There are water quality and certified crop advisor credits available for each session and we will share the link and QR code at the end of the session. And there will also be three poll questions throughout the presentation. So if you could take a second to answer them when they pop up on your screen, we would really appreciate it. If you have any questions during the presentation, please enter them in the chat and we will facilitate them when the speaker has concluded. Today, we are super excited to have Monty Bottens. He's a farmer from Cambridge, Illinois. At, Bottom, at Bottens Family Farm, he practices long-term no-till cover crop and now integrated livestock on 2,800 acres. He grows non-GMO food, non-GMO and food grade corn and soybeans, along with some small grains, specialty crops, hay and grazing crops. With his wife, Robin Monty co-founded Grateful Graze, a direct-to-consumer beef, chicken, pork and eggs business. Monty is the CEO of Ag Solutions Network, where he hosts the Ag Emerge podcast and a regenerative ag tech, ag tech investor. And I will link the Ag Solutions Network website and the YouTube channel in the chat box. They're both really amazing resources. And he is with us today to discuss the technology of virtual fencing, but he has so much more to offer. So go check him out. With that, I will share, stop sharing my screen and Monty, you are welcome to share yours. All right. <clears throat> Thank you. Appreciate it, Amber. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, good to see you. I, I'm, 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 I'm a real person, not just a robot or AI behind the presentation. So I thought you should uh, have to look at my ugly mug for a little bit. But uh, this is uh, actually one of my uh, hides from our uh, very first um uh, British whites that we processed, uh, and he was so delicious, I decided to remind myself every day of him, so there you go. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and share my screen, and we'll, uh, we'll make sure everything's working and, and be off to the races. Now, I'm going to go over here. There we go, and so I think, Amber, does that look correct to you? probably muted herself. Yes, so. that looks good. Sorry. Very good. No problem. So my name is Monty Bottens um, from Cambridge, Illinois. We're about 35 miles away from Deer and Company's headquarters in Moline, which is the Quad City area right where Interstate 80 crosses the Mississippi River into Iowa. So we're from the Yankee part of Illinois. And when you go in the middle of the state and south, that's the Kentucky part of Illinois. So a lot of the people who settled in this area were from the Northeast. You know, the traditional story of uh, plow and farm the land until you exhaust it and move on. That worked while there was more land to do. And now we've, we've kind of run out of that. So we have to, uh, instead of plow and exhaust land, we have to do the best with what we got and really overcome practices of the past. So that's what we're all about, uh, or uh, focus completely on the soil health principles and align our farm as much as possible. And that's what uh, got us away from just corn and soybeans, the boring Midwest crops to all the diversity that we have today. So let's have a little fun. Uh, my farming background, um, no-till, uh, really it's a long-term never-till. I don't cheat. You know, there's no vertical tillage, no anhydrous ammonia, all those kind of things on the cropland. We do advanced crop nutrition practices, so everything is, uh, every nutrient the plant needs, timed to exactly when it needs it, so that we use less and uh, create a healthy crop, then that becomes more resistant to diseases and pests. Uh, we plant multi-species cover crops, 
Um, essentially on every acre, I have 40 acres that I don't because uh, it's part of a long-term uh, study, a 10-year study that we've had uh, to verify the differences over time in soil quality parameters. Uh, we have livestock, uh, we're integrating for soil health. We do the direct to consumer sales. And then most recently, uh, which everybody is super interested in is virtual fencing. So we'll have some fun uh, talking about the application of that today. For fun, um, I thought I'd throw this in because uh, if you're listening in in Vermont or somewhere there in the Northeast, you gotta be wondering why in the world is some corn farmer from Illinois got anything of interest for me? And I thought I'd share that uh, I traveled in, and moved to California originally in 2001. And I began working with uh, dairy farmers there and we developed a lot of systems for dairy. And I, I became aware of that vital connection between the soil, forage and, uh, and the animal. And from not only a milk production standpoint, uh, longevity standpoint, services for conception, uh, you know, fat content, all those kind of things um, had a lot of uh, interest in and uh, experience with. So one of those things that we developed out there in the Central Valley of California, and, and I know one of the people on the phone here says that, you know, they graduated from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and, you know, Madison claims to be America's dairy land, but we all know California still is number one, uh, but it's slipping precipitously. So We'll see. Some someday, maybe Wisconsin will be back in the number one spot. Uh, it was just for fun. Anyway, um, we developed a thing called the Faster Forage Program. So, uh, way we help dairymen transition to strip till and no till is most people aren't interested in not doing tillage because it's something they've always done. It's something they're comfortable with. It's very predictable. So what we found is that when we can convert from a winter forage crop to corn quicker and avoid the, su avoid the summer heat, we can improve the fiber digestibility, we can improve the starch content of the corn, we can improve all these uh, milk producing parameters, and then all of a sudden everybody wanted to strip till corn. So our, our you know, evil goal was to get farmers to do less tillage because we know it's better for the soil, and the way we position that is, hey, let's uh, grow crops faster and get a potential for a third crop in the California context. And in the meantime, your soils are going to improve over time. So we've been doing that for about 20 years out in California. We have a whole team out there now and allowed me to move back east to my farm. Uh, one of the things we did there is a multi-year forage sampling. So we, we did, uh, you know, IVDMD sampling, uh, NDF D30s, uh, all those kind of things. And... Uh, um, let me see something went away change there sorry but uh, we really learned that timing of nutrition tillage all these entire system how that worked together how that uh, changed the quality of the forage which then related to um, cattle or cow uh, production and reproductivity uh, so we're pretty interested in that uh, actually, I was a, had a team. We we're a nutritionist uh, for 3,200 head dairy, and we were able to prove these concepts in a in a large scale feeding uh, situation. I, I'm very proud. Uh, this is something that the industry doesn't like to talk about: is reducing dry matter intake because you know in California at least, you know, more you can get into a cow, the more it's going to come out, might meet the magical two to one ratio. Well, the reality is, is we're putting a lot of crap in the cows. And uh, if it isn't digestible, it comes out the rear end. So we focused on the forage digestibility and quality to the animal. And we're actually able to reduce dry matter intake, which reduces acres needed to create a gallon of milk. And also, you know, inputs and all those kind of things. So there's, I, everybody knows the, the advantages to not having to feed as much. But at the same time, we increased energy corrected milk by seven pounds. Now, to a third of that came from uh, milk fat content. Uh, the energy corrected, the rest was from fluid volume. So there's just some amazing things that you can do. And the other thing I love about dairies is you guys can change something today and you know in two days in the tank what happened. I, you know, I change stuff in my field and I don't know for two, three years if it made a difference. So um, if you have ADHD, dairying might be great for you uh, if you lack patience and such, but it's just amazing to see um, the feedback loop that we can get with working with dairies. 
Uh, also, our company sponsored several forage research trials at South Dakota State University with Dr. David Casper when he was there, just learning all the ins and outs of, of how forage in the, in the room and works and looking at crops other than corn. So like right now, trying to transition dairy farmers to BMR sorghum uh, sedan grass or BMR forage sorghum uh, in order to not grow the starch in California because we can do that more competitively in the Midwest and we don't have the water to grow it in California. So trying to help them transition to the severe water issues we have affecting California. And then just to say I was willing to put my money where my mouth was, I almost built a 700 cow robotic dairy farm in uh, 2015. Uh, the date you're probably like, huh, oh, he missed a bullet, but there's another reason uh, why we chose not to go that way. And we're going to get into that. So a <clears throat> little overview of our farm and, and who we are, what we do. I'm fifth generation. We've been farming the same land from 1869. Uh, my great, great grandfather bought it from two sisters out of New York that owned it. And uh, that's where they, they settled when they came here. Today, we're up to uh, 2,500 acres of cropland, uh, 226 acres of pasture. We are committed. We use no neonics, no fungicides, no insecticides. Uh, the only uh, thing that I bounced out again, let's see. I am sharing screen. Let's go back. There we go. So the only thing that uh, we're currently using in the pesticide world is herbicides because uh, in our context, we feel herbicides have less overall total uh, negative consequences than the tillage does. So you, you do one or the other, you, you till or that, but we're continue to do research to get into no-till organic. And uh, Aaron Silva up the UW Madison's done a great, great amount of work on that. And we're continuing to refine that for our context. Uh, like we said earlier, grown non GMO corn bean Wheat, triticale, winter barley, uh, looking at buckwheat this year, hay crops, all that, beef, pork, chicken, and eggs, we raise and sell that direct to consumer. So just to give you a little timeline of how we got to where we are, uh, we really started on the soil health principles, maxim minimizing that soil disturbance in 96, we converted to less nitrogen on and no-till. You know, we were maximizing that soil cover by being no-till in 1996. And then my travels to California kind of we, we stagnated there for about 20 years until 2016. I came home. We looked at cover crops and intercropping, uh, increasing the biodiversity with uh, multi species and such. And in 17s, when we also integrated the livestock. So, everybody, uh, there should be a quiz at the end of this, I hope. But uh, here's it's really important you have to memorize these five principles and have them in the back of your mind all the time. And I think it's really important that any farming or, or dairying decision that you make, you think about how does that impact my soil? Because long term, the soil is what you're going to leave to your kids and your grandkids uh, or to someone else. And that uh, is going to depend on supporting humanity in the future. So to remember uh, these uh, soil health principles, I created this kind of fun way to remember them. First off, minimize the servants. You know, don't be a moron. Okay, so a moron person is uh, if you do a little bit of tillage, uh, more is better. If you put on a little bit of fertilizer, what do you th always think? Oh, uh, more, a little more is better. So don't be a moron. Think about how you can do less. How can you put less energy into that system, whether it's in tillage or in products? How can you how can you do less? And less is more when it comes to soil health. The second thing, keep the ground covered. Don't farm naked, okay? I say don't farm naked. Nobody wants to see your dirt. So always keep that ground covered. It's imperative to keep it covered. And especially when you're dealing with silage crops, man, oh man, that is naked soil once the choppers go through. So have a plan. You know, aerial seed that ahead of harvest to get it, you know, 10 days ahead of harvest to get it growing a little bit. So that way when you chop it, it's germinated and it's ready to go or seed immediately. If you don't have a drill in the same field as the choppers to add to the chaos, um, you know, you're, you're missing an opportunity and, and you're sending your soil, you know, out to the ocean. Third thing, don't farm dead. Okay. So we don't want, you know, just 90 days of a crop or 120 days of a crop every day that life is able to be growing on your farm. You want life. 
the soil responds to life. So think about how you can widen that window of improving your soil. The fourth thing, don't farm boring, okay? You know, God made us all different for a reason. Can you imagine what it'd be like if they're all the same? How boring would that be? The same thing, how boring would it be if every bird was the same or every, every plant was the same? Diversity is key. Don't be boring. Try to look at diversity in, this is an opportunity in dairy that most people don't have. You can harvest diverse crops together and it's a forage. You know, one of the things we were looking in is growing silage corn and growing uh, climbing soybeans so that we could create a higher for higher protein content silage corn. You know, look at ways to increase diversity within there. And then fifth, don't forget the meat or in your guys' case, don't forget the milk. You know, integrate livestock. Uh, it, it's key to soil health. You know, our soils evolved you know, from here in the Midwest, from large herds of bison and elk and deer and those kind of things. And, and the farms and the land in the Northeast weren't without animals on them, you know, in those forest soils and such. There was, there was animals within there that were recycling nutrients, improving uh, the plants and trees that were there. So don't think that, uh, you know, I don't own any barns, so it makes it really easy to not keep an animal in a barn, right? So just because you have a barn doesn't mean they need to be there all the time. Figure out ways to impact the land with the animals because that impact is, is positive if done right. So some of the fun things we're doing on our farm, uh, upper left-hand corner there is our planter. We plant everything variable rate, three different nutrient solutions simultaneously variable rate. Uh, top center, we've done things where we'll plant crops uh, in like low carbon crops on the flatter areas and we'll plant high carbon crops on the more hilly areas so that way we're improving the soil quality in those areas that are more eroded from long-term moldboard plowing. Upper right that's actually no-till corn into that high biomass cover crop. When you do it with the right technology and equipment it doesn't want for anything and you can get great yields. Uh, bottom right there I am standing out in some 60 inch row corn that we're interseeding and we were uh, looking at, are there ways that we can graze sheep within a standing cornfield? Is there a way that we can get a jump start on those cover crops so that way when I harvest that early, I can throw the cattle in and get more days on cover crops. Uh, we do companion cropping there, bottom center. That there is wheat and soybeans together. So we'll come through, harvest the wheat, and then the soybeans will, will come through and get a second crop, um, two crops in one year. Uh, we plant green. That's my standard practice on soybeans. Love it. We plant uh, soybeans into rye, green, no problems at all. And then uh, the left center there, you can see that's an intercropper that we did. So where we seed cover crops within standing corn, that's uh, V3 to V5. So we've tried a lot of things, uh, kind of like the uh, insurance commercial. We've seen a lot of things because we've done a lot of things or whatever. That's that's kind of what we're what we're up to. <clears throat> so where's where's the proof and such so some of you folks may recognize the the gentleman there in the bib overhauls that's Gabe Brown um, and they hosted a soil health academy at our farm and you know we do did some infiltration tests and it was kind of interesting because this was the neighbor's field across the road you know it took 15 minutes and 36 seconds to get an inch of rain into that long-term tillage ground uh, right across the road in our no-till cover crops with grazing and that no-till and grazing can go in the same sentence, you know, two minutes and 28 seconds. So we can get a rain like that here. And I'd rather go into the ground versus take soil with it as it leaves to a stream. And I think that that's really important to always think about because not only does it take your very best soil with it, but it takes nutrients and everything else. And that is a pollutant for people downstream. So it's not soil loss, okay? It's not nutrient loss, newsflash. That is soil pollution and that is nutrient pollution. So my loss becomes someone else's cost. And you, we have to change our thinking on this. We have to think about the whole, the whole context my problem creates problems for many other people downstream, communities that get drinking water, you know, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, 
watershed uh, fish and wildlife. Anytime that we have a system that is leaking soil and leaking nutrients, we are polluting something for someone else. So like I said earlier, I was looking at building a, you know, 700 cow barn robots, you know, it's like the ultimate Dr. Evil plan, you know, 1 million cows in a barn. Um, you know, they'd go in there and it was all robotic, very mechanical, complete control. I mean, I was just, oh, this is amazing. Cows go in there and they live their whole life in a barn, you know, they get kicked out, I guess, for a couple of months when they're dry. But that just seemed like the penultimate to me. Then I ran across Gabe and I saw what was happening on his farm with this soil organic matter. And then I saw what the nutritional, just the look at the color of those eggs on the right. You know, even Ray Charles can see there's a difference there. And what I would say is that got me to thinking. It's like, how does this guy get 11.1% organic matter in North Dakota? Uh, North Dakota, right? It's North. He has like an 80-day growing season. How is this possible when we're getting, we're happy with our 3.5%? So I had to know more. So for my wife's birthday, I, I took her to North Dakota. You know, it's what any romantic husband would do. And we went to see his ranch, just see what he's up to. And, you know, it's one of those, uh, I'm from the home, only about an hour away is the hometown of Ronald Reagan. And he had the uh, famous saying of trust, but verify. So I trusted Gabe, but I needed to verify. So we took a road trip for my wife's birthday. And sure enough, look at that. That's a handful of soil with cover crops in the background. And his aggregates are about the size of gravel. I mean, it is crazy how well aggregated and look at the color of that. I mean, it's not Photoshopped. I mean, that's, that's his soil in his hand. And it, it's, it's pretty amazing thing to behold. And then I looked, I'm like, wait a minute, you can make grass-fed meat that looks like that are you kidding me that's a new york strip i'm thinking hmm well that's awful interesting so after doing a deep dive with him and Dwayne beck jay fuhr for you know in the dakotas there for a week uh this is a photo i took of myself coming home and i really had a headache and it was at that moment in time i knew i had to do what i call project move so there you go, 55 years later, uh, there's the cattle are back on our, on our home farm. You can see a calf was just born up on that hillside and we're bringing cattle back to the land, integrating it, trying to mimic the bison herds of you know, 150, 200 years ago in order to regenerate our soil, to overcome all of the degradation that we've done and my, my ancestors have done uh, to that soil. And it's, it's been a pretty exciting journey, which led to Grateful Grace. And essentially, it's um, now the animals that we raise on our farm, uh, we sell direct to consumer. And one of my favorite sayings is, you know, cows are getting a bad rap these days. And, and I like to say it's, it's not the cow, it's the how. So we're really, really key on that how. And we've, it's just been a great way to connect with community. You know, we've hosted soil judging events for the state section. We do a concert with the cows. That's a lot of fun. We set up a trailer out in the uh, pasture, put a band on it, and we bring the cow herd right up behind. Um, and people just love sitting there. And, and the girls like to be entertained because uh, I introduce the bulls next day. So at least I'm, I'm giving them a nice night out, you know, winding them, dining them a little bit before uh, they get busy. So it's, uh, it's always kind of fun. Uh, we toast tours you can see in the upper right people want to know they want to know more about their food and they want to connect with great soil and great farmers and we're happy to provide that for them bottom left that's such a, a picture of two people two doctors that are writing a book uh, uh, the lady in the middle she's a teacher at palmer chiropractic college she's a doctor of chiropractic and brian on the right there he's a cardiologist and they're writing um a great book with all the research related to grass fed proteins and health. So, but uh, yeah, we, we get a chance to enjoy some great food and deliver it to people's homes. And, and one of our goals was we didn't want to raise crappy grass fed. I mean, there's plenty of people doing that. So we really took that knowledge. I kind of learned in feeding dairy cattle, 
out in California with the forage crops, knowing that, um, you know, milk and meat go together, you know, and we, we took that to make a high energy, well-balanced diet to great, great meat. And, uh, that's what we're, we're pretty excited about. Plus it regenerates the soil at the same time. So how are we doing this? On the left is 160 acre field that was, you know, all corn and beans forever. And we, we put temporary fence out there and, and we section it off and we're moving fence all the time. On the right is a photo of our um, uh, home pasture that we're at in certain times of year where we don't have cover crop forages to feed. And all those dash lines are poly wire going everywhere, section, sectioning them off to get the managed grazing impact that we want. So a lot of work to make it happen, no doubt. And then I'm reminded by one of my favorite quotes, uh, electric light bulb did not come from continuous improvement of candles. Okay. So when we got polywire, that really was a step forward on managed grazing. And it, it really allowed us to do some different things. Well, this is the next step. And this is the electric bulb if polywire is the candle. And in December of 21, I, I got the, the first virtual uh, fence collar installed uh, right there, F11. Reason is she's so tame, I can just come right up and pet her. So I thought, well, let's put it on her. So if I have a problem, I can catch her without having to crawl her. And sure enough, put it on and like five minutes later, she dunks it in the water tank. I'm like, oh no, here I did. I killed the one and only. And I was worried about it, but luckily enough, no problem. In fact, I still got the original collar in service. Um, and it works just fine. So it's uh, it's a lot of fun to, to uh, do that. But here's how it works. Here's why you all came today. They have uh, two basic collars. Uh, the smaller one is for sheep and goats. Larger ones for cattle. And uh, so you buy a collar. And if you have a cell phone, you're all set. So um, the collars, uh, I'll go into pricing and everything. But essentially, that collar has a... Um, it kind of gives you a view of what they look like on the animals here. That collar has solar panels on the side that recharge that battery. And we get pretty cloudy here in Illinois in the winter. And I, I've never had an issue. Now, if you're inside a barn all the time, um, there would probably be a need to uh, reset uh, that battery. You know, every couple months have to swap batteries for charging. But in me being outside on pasture, I've never had a problem with that. Um, it uses GPS with wasp correction. So you've got that, you know, roughly plus or minus uh, three feet accuracy. If you're under uh, trees, you got to give it a little more room because any, if you've driven a tractor with GPS under trees, you know, it, it don't work quite as well. So probably 10 feet around trees. Uh, it has a long range cellular. So it's not your typical cellular that you drop anywhere. It uses a, a longer range bandwidth to collect to, uh, connect to the cellular network and then also Bluetooth. So they can all connect across to each other and kind of make a, a herd mesh network, if you will. Um, and you can connect direct to your phone out in the pasture with them and play a little tune to where you can find your, find the cow that you're looking for. Um, so that's, that's uh, pretty neat how it works. And plus with that, it opens up a lot of possibilities for the future being a data hub for that animal. So this is how it works. You draw a virtual fence on your phone, cow approaches it, starts to play a tone. And that it's a musical tone and that's actually patented uh, so that it's really funny. They, they learn that, you know, on the 10th tone, they better turn. Otherwise uh, a shock is coming. So um, one day, funny story, I had a, a mother and her daughter were out touring our farm and giving them a little tour and sure enough here comes one of our cows and i'm i know i'm just on the outside of the virtual fencing area and you know city folks no problem but uh they're they're sitting there and and the cow approaches the virtual zone uh virtual zone and it starts to play the tone i'm like oh no please 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 turn around and she let it go all the way up to number nine. And then she turned her head and it went back down. And I thought, oh, true. I didn't want to see a cow get shocked, you know, three feet away from us. So it's amazing, uh, you know, just like 
you know how cows are. They they learn things and um, they'll push it right to the limit and then then come back. So it works extraordinarily well. Uh, training on the cow herd, I put them on in day one and I didn't do anything. I just let them get adjusted to it because they're like, what's this different thing around my neck I'm not used to. And then day two, we had them set up in a two acre paddock and essentially excluded a half acre of the south end of that paddock and that they would interact with that. So, you know, I'm getting these alerts all the time that such and such cow has received a pulse and all that. So it was kind of a carnage there the first day as they're learning it. Um, and then day two, day three did the same thing and it had really gone down. So then we did it on two sides, became virtual within a single wire paddock and you know, a little more that day. And then the next day we went three sides and, and like fifth or sixth day, we were complete virtual. Uh, it was amazing to me how, how quick they learn. Here's some screenshots of the app, plus a little look at what's possible in the future. Um, I don't know who Jumbo is, but uh, Jumbo is a troublemaker there. Got 11 tones and, and two shocks. So uh, Jumbo's learning, I guess. But anyway, it gives you a heat map of where they spend time. But take a look on the right, and there's a picture showing the activity and at what time of day the activity happened. But Ida looks to me to be a little more active there between uh, 1,300 hours and, and 1,900 hours, right? So she had a six-hour time frame that I would guess she was a little frisky. So I think it's a great way in the future uh, when you compare it to the activity of the whole herd, uh, we'll be able to identify heat detections, lameness, uh, and any other issues related to activity. So uh, that's a, a future add-on that they continue to build in the background that'll be much better than, well, the virtual fencing is plain amazing, but there'll be more, more things they can do with it in the future. All right, so I took these uh, two screenshots this morning and you take a look there on the left. Um, the bottom pasture is where I've got, I just weaned uh, last week. So we don't, um, we do two, spring and fall calves. So we're not calving all the time like a dairy. So we have a group that we wean. And I put the collars on them last week. And then yesterday, yeah, yesterday, I actually shortened up that fence on the south end. You can see it there where, it's in the middle shot, I zoomed in a little bit, where it's it's north of the boundary fence. And you can see there was some time spent, that's what that green is out there, that some people went through the fence and got a tone and a shock and then uh, return. But that's where they're, they're learning. And so those are 10 month old uh, calves. And we're teaching them for that because the intention is in August, they're actually, I'm gonna send those to a, a place 45 miles away and I'll be able to, someone's going to watch their water, but we can watch their status on the phone without having to uh, be there all the time. Uh, the picture on the right is just showing uh, where we're doing some grazing out in a, a former a pine tree uh, planted uh, acreage that was uh, a CRP project. And we're using the cattle to reclaim uh, those areas and restore back to grasslands. So anyway, it's just, it's pretty amazing uh, what you can, what you can do with this. A little overview, currently there's 72,000 collars in service at 3,600 farmers, and there's 440 million hours of grazing time. So the reason I partnered with No Fence is they were the first in the world, and they also have the most experience in the world, but uh, they weren't in the U.S., so I begged and, and uh, uh, pleaded and, and got them to come to the U.S. So the neat part is uh, here's a look at the, the pilot projects and where they're located, you know, whether they're, they're sheep or collars or cattle collars. So we're getting a good diversity of locations of, of where these are. Um, <clears throat> here's, a, here's a fun example of how uh, they work. If you take a look, uh, this is actually from Idaho where they do bale grazing on frozen ground. So they set out the bales ahead of time. So then they actually put um, virtual fence lines here and there. So they, they restricted the cattle, just eat those four bales. You can see them all huddled around there. And here's the next day, 
they move to the middle set of bales when they when they let them in. So what a great way to do bale grazing on frozen ground. I don't know if any of you are doing this, but there's nothing more fun than trying to get a temporary post to go into frozen ground, especially when you have to get out the drill. So virtual fencing for solar, that's another thing they're doing, uh, is being able to use sheep or within a solar field in order to paddock them and not have to have um, the wires running around for maintenance people or you know interference with the electric panels and such. So this is uh, uh, another opportunity for that as, as solar farms continue to grow. Here you go, what everybody wants to know, the cost. Uh, sheep collar, 199, the cow collar, 299. Um, three bucks a month per head for the data services and the app is what's in there. So we, um, uh, when I add that all up, well, first off, it is eligible under a 528 uh, plan as far as grazing management to receive uh, equip related monies for that or CSP if you're integrating crops, uh, cattle into cropland. So there's uh, cer certainly some opportunities for it to fall under current programs, but in the future, look for it to be its own standalone program too, because many countries in Europe are currently doing that, Spain, England, Norway all have compensation for farmers who um, who utilize the virtual fencing equipment. So here you go, questions I'm asked, cost per head per day. If you bought it and it has a complete two year warranty and you consider the data services, you ran it two years and then just plain threw it away. That's 51 cents per head per day. If you, their guesstimate is a five year life and that's probably right i mean some will last longer than that some will be on the bull that decided to you know um destroy it or something when he was doing his thing um you know 26 cents per head per day on a five-year life but the way i look at that is my labor and fencing that i'm spending on my herd today essentially pays for these units so then i'm taking that time that we freed up and we're doing much better management so we can fence you know, up to ponds or give them a slight ac access to a pond for a small period of time in the day, and then I can restrict them back. We can go through timbers and gullies in seconds. It, it's no, no issue at all. If we have a paddock that was overgrazed in a certain area on the previous pass, I can exclude that on this pass. Uh, and here's a beautiful thing compared to polywire. I don't have to connect to an ex exterior power source. They can be if I want a circular shaped paddock, if I want a star shaped paddock and I want it to be in the middle of the field, fine, who cares? It can be any shape, any location. Uh, the other beautiful thing is multiple moves per day. So I have a 20 acre area of the ranch here where I'm doing um, 10X moves. I call it my million pound march. So you go with a million pound stocking density and we actually move that 10 times per day. In the past, I've had to have the unfortunate intern of the summer do that, and they essentially camp there all day, setting wire, taking it down, setting wire, taking it down, moving water, you know, just all day long. So for that 20 acres, you know, there's some, some poor kid for 12 days out there is essentially uh, just camping with the cattle to, to set fence. Now, with this, I can just move it on my phone, you know, and advance them. The water would stay in the same spot, but just advance 10 times a day, you know, and then you reset the next day and then do repeat. So that is huge for dry matter intake and quality of dry matter intake, which would be unbelievable in boosting milk production per acre. Battery life. Like I said, never had to recharge your batteries. Uh, barns might be a problem. Some behavior observations. So this is on row crop lands, summer cover crops, and you know it had a lot of rain. You can see the wire on the right there. And when you go to set a new paddock, what do the what do the cows do? They just stand there and you know complain and watch you set the new paddock. You know there's there's still plenty to eat, but no, they're going to stand there for 20 minutes to watch you do your work. Then you let them in, and what do they do? 
they run around the edge of the paddock to see where their new fit, new boundaries are. And then they go back to eating. So, you know, there's potential of gaining 20, 30 minutes of eating time per day by not having to do this. So when I, I advance the paddocks with virtual fencing, they just calmly, um, uh, calmly advance into the next, it's not a physical, they don't, this is what blew my mind. They don't associate the shock correction with a physical location. It's purely to that song that it plays. So I find that really, really neat. So they just, if they don't hear the song, they keep moving forward. They hear the song, they turn. And and that's that's how it works. It, it's pretty sleep, slick. The other fun thing I get to do on cow-calf pairs is um, they can advance on... Uh, the calves can go into the best forage ahead of the cows and then mom can call them back when they're, when it's time to, to nurse at night. So we actually observed, uh, I, I haven't done the weaning weights this year, but last year it was 35 pounds better weaning weights. So I'm, I'm looking forward to getting that compiled this year uh, to see where we're at. But I think that's a definite advantage. Plus we grow a lot of the, you know, forage sorghum and then this is what happens. You mow it down and, or drive it down in order to set a wire, you know, what a waste. So some, some scenarios for virtual fencing. Uh, and a lot of times I talk to corn grower groups and no cattle. Well, here you go. Now it's time to get started. You know, if you're set stocking out in the pasture and bringing them in, you probably are all aware that you can double a stocking rate, you know, when you go to daily moves, uh, but just haven't had time to do it. So this is a great opportunity for a set stock grazer to, to get to daily moves. Rotational grazer, maybe you have a 10 acre, you know, paddock division and you put them in there for five days and move on to the next one. Now you could subdivide those, those paddocks you already have set up real easy. Uh, daily move grazer, hit your target time every day. I mean, there's, there can be variances in target timing of, of those moves and that, that's a dry matter intake issue now on dairy because you're coming up to the barn at the same time you're likely setting that fence at the same time so they got a new paddock to go back to so not as big of a deal but i think what is a big deal is giving them a portion of that paddock and then giving them another portion that allows them then to get up and eat and increase dry matter intake and the quality of that dry matter intake um fun for those that get to do uh, polywire do you love doing it when it's frozen? I mentioned that, drilling a hole in the ground. That's just a blast. Um, I also enjoy when it's pouring rain and it's so muddy that the ATV can't even do it, you know, and you're walking across the field in your mud boots. Uh, and then plus you're holding all these rods in the poly wire and there's lightning going on. Oh, that's a blast. Uh, the other thing is when you got other stuff going on, you're planting, harvesting, whatever, and, and you got to do the move, whether you like it or not. Um, some people might know what a vacation is. Um, you know, you got to have somebody responsible for taking care of things when, when you actually leave the farm once every 10 years. So this uh, enables that, right? And who likes to fence through the woods or crossing a creek or gully or steep hill or put it in if a rocky area? You know, those are all joys. So a lot of things, uh, lifestyle improvement with virtual fence. So long term, here's what I'm excited about. I want to. I'm calling this auto graze, um, and I, I trademark it because I thought it's that good. But I, I think uh, we take the no fence, and it's going to be connected to sensors for movement, tail sensors for calving, rumen sensors for pH and feedback on what what we're actually feeding, and we're going to get all that information. We're going to bring together. I uh, have a couple groups working on automating water, mineral, the oiler, so it follows the herd. You know, a little robot that drags a sled with these uh, things that they need. Uh, use imagery from planet.com in order to take daily images of pasture and know what that quality and quantity growth of uh, forage is in order to plug it in, all of this into... Uh, essentially uh, machine learning, or now everybody calls it, you know, artificial intelligence, and uh, use that to make a decision of the assessment of my total farm to know 
hey, things are growing fast and going fast. We need to move fast. You know, when things get dry or heat or drought, things are growing slow. Oh, we need to slow up and maybe we need to supplement for a little bit to let the grass get ahead of us. So rather than just doing the same thing on the first of the month, because we've always done that, we're going to get to really intelligent decisions related to grazing. You know, I know some great grazers that are 70 years old and they'll, they'll still tell you that, eh, I, you know, every year is different, do the best I can. And I'm thinking, man, I've been at this for five, six years now. And I, I've learned a lot, but I know I still don't know what I need to know. So I think it, uh, I think there's possibilities. And, you know, like I like to say is uh, you make grazing so easy, even a corn farmer could do it. Right. So referring to the caveman commercials. So corn farmers were kind of a little bit like caveman when it comes back to livestock, right? But here's the hope. I think feedlots, well, we know feedlots exist today because the most economical way to produce meat. But what if we can use technology to make grazing competitive with feedlots? When that happens, then we can shift away from the feedlot. Just like when we did the faster forage program, people didn't want to go to strip till. They wanted the benefits of that. The same thing, if we can provide the technology that provides an economic benefit, that's how we can change how farming is done. And, you know, the reason we do it that way is it's just playing off the right thing for the cattle. You know, if you look at there, I got a, that's the young crop, right? That's the, they were just weaned. That's the 200 calves from last year. And there's my grandson. You know, we're doing this for the next generations. And I think that's uh, important just to look at mimic nature. What, is, what do they want? What is best for them? And do everything we can to make that possible. Another one of my driving quotes is, what did me in was not what I did not know. It was the things I knew, which were not so. What do we assume every day and just don't question? And what does it take to think about and question that? So now I need you to think about your own operation, your own uh, work that you do. And, and what is the next right step for you? One of the things I like to say is, uh, I think as farmers, we've forgotten it's all about food. You know, do you enjoy your food? I just, it just hit me. I'm like, wow, look at this. These are eggs that I raised, uh, sausage and wild mushrooms. All of that was my product from my farm. And I'm like, oh, the cheese. I don't have a dairy yet. But my, my wife says I can't have a dairy. I'm, I'm sorry. I, she drew the line at restaurants and dairy. Something about in common where you're, she, she just didn't want to go that far. So uh, I would love to have a dairy. But if you can help me out, talk to my wife, that'd be great. But anyway, you know, I think we've forgotten about eating and enjoying food. We've turned it into an industrial product. And, and it's just not, it's not like we're to get nourishment and enjoyment from food. Another thing is, is when you're thinking about the next right steps for your farm is don't be afraid of lunatics. Okay. Joel Salatin is a self-described lunatic farmer. And honestly, this crazy man is really responsible for the pastured poultry and pastured pig movement and a lot with grass-fed cattle. He's done amazing things in Virginia. And I learned that I can always learn something from somebody else. I go and attend as many events and webinars that I possibly can because I'm always going to glean something else that can help me think differently. Now, Gabe likes to call it the first soil health principle is context. I disagree. It's just plain the law. You cannot get around this law. It's like a law of physics. You know, I haven't given you specific things to do on your farm for a reason. Uh, you're in charge of your farm. You know, I've shared about how I'm trying to put principles into practice and, and how other people have. But your context is for you to fully understand. But... <clears throat> Don't use it as an excuse to try something new. Well, look at that. He's got those Midwest soils. They're so perfect. And he's got those big fields. And oh, no, no, I can't do that. Well, if you want to use that as an excuse, great. 
But the time for excuses is over because you have kids and grandkids and communities that are depending on you. So you have to look at your situation and how you can do better. How, that, how can you more perfectly fit with the soil health principles? So here's some of the things I've done and had to undo in my farming career. You know, no-till. We did it to save the soil. Cover crops. Why did we do it? capture carbon diversity water management weed control neonic free when i learned that neonic seed treatments one seed has enough to kill like 1.2 million bees i thought and i plant 35,000 of those per acre my math or my calculator doesn't have enough zeros for that i just thought this is nonsense can we do without it you bet we can we've done it for several years and i'm noticing the benefits i see the wildlife coming back I noticed the beneficials are there to keep take care of slugs and other issues from pests that we might have. Fungicide free. You know, why are we farmers across the Midwest spraying fungicides everywhere? Now the big companies want you to spray it three times a year. Why not? You know, if two is better, if two is good, three is better. So there you go, being a moron again. And you know, I look at everybody's complaining about, oh, now I got to run a turbo tail to break down my residue. Well, you moron, uh, you sprayed it with stuff that degrade. You just killed the organisms that are helping you degrade it. So anyway, we stopped that nonsense a long time ago. Non-GMO, you know, I read some studies where the GMO insertions in plants are winding up in the human, uh, have been detected in human genes. I'm like, oof. Uh, I don't really want to be Roundup ready. And I really don't want to make someone in my community, you know, corn borer resistant or, or rootworm resistant. So I think I'll just stop that. And uh, I'm glad we did. Uh, I, can, I can sleep better. Livestock integration, that was a big step for us. You know, we improved the soil and, and we provide healthy food for families to enjoy. And it's just been amazing connecting with families. Uh, if you don't sell direct to consumer and don't think it's for you, I didn't really think it was for me, but I, I knew we had to get more value out of the, the beef that we were raising because it just couldn't compete with corn and soybeans without higher value and connecting direct to consumers allowed us to do that. But the stories and um, connections we've made with families is, is really great. And, uh, and I stopped dreaming of a robotic dairy. Yes, because I, I didn't think it was uh, the right thing to do. I don't think an animal was designed to, to live that kind of a life. So my future plans, diversity. We're looking into perennials now and permaculture crops, uh, small grains with cover crops uh, to grow for cover crop seed, heritage grains, so open pollinated corn, uh, einkorn, and uh, you know soft red winter wheat heritage stuff, uh, look, looking at milling and creating ciders. And I actually got permission to plant some wine grapes. So I'm going to try to explore doing that. But we also want to do more on processing, distribution, and marketing. How could we be the hub for other farmers to participate in this regenerative movement and then share the profits back with everybody? Don't just become another Cargill or ADM. Look at a way to uh, make it equitable for everybody involved. And uh, I'm pretty excited about that. On our farm, Future profit streams, I think a third of that profit stream is going to come from crops. I think a third of it will come from value add. And then as wild as it might seem, I think a third of it's going to come from ecosystem services because we're seeing such a tremendous increase in wildlife and abundance in the fields. I think that's a, a definite opportunity that people want to support uh, monetarily. So what's your next right crop, uh, your next right step? Is it cover crops for your summer slump? when all your cool season grasses just kind of peter out and get a little tired before they kick up again in the fall, look at overseeding cover crops that can, can help bridge the gap. Is it going to non-GMO, demanding non-GMO, getting rid of neonics on seed treatments? Is it grazing your heifers? I mean, how many more research studies do we need to have about grazing heifers helps with their rumen development and longevity, their hoof health and their longevity of breeding over time? How many more studies do you need before you start doing it? Daily moves. It's just plain as day. If you're not moving daily, do it. I, I guess the only problem is, is figuring out 
uh, going over maybe your quota with your co-op or something because you're producing more milk. That may maybe a reason not to do it. Or multiple moves per day. Again, more production, better breeding, better health. Um, it, it, it's just a better balanced diet. You don't give them the paddock and they eat all the ice cream first and then come back and get their salad later. That's, that's the whole concept is eating a balanced diet and letting your pastures recover better. Or maybe there's something else that you know you need to do that you've thought about for a long time. It's Nike. Just do it. Do the right thing. Or what if there's something that you just don't like to do? You know, I don't get a kick out of spraying. It's kind of a necessary evil at this time, but I continue to research how could I do this organic no-till because I really don't want to do that long-term. But if any of you have a border collie, um, you know what they're like. They, they, they live for one thing, and that is to work. And here you can see I'm hauling cattle to the next farm. There's the cover crop seeding seeder going and seeding the next crop. And uh, you got to be just like a border collie. Work hard every day and enjoy the ride. Just be in the moment and, and get it done. But, you know, when you're taking that step, don't make a shortcut. Don't cable tie it up. You know, do it right. Do it at enough scale that you learn something. And if it works, don't just say, yeah, I tried that. It worked. Do it. Get a plan to get it on all your acres in three years. Everything you try. It should take you three years to get to 100%. That's a safe timeline to do it. I'm reminded by this cartoon, change is not easy, right? Every choice I make has an impact on everything else around me. And guess what? Every choice you make does too. And what I, you know, who wants to change? Everybody always says, oh yeah, I want change. You know, who wants to change? Oh, uh, you mean I got to spend $3 more a pound for grass-fed beef? Oh, well, I want grass-fed beef and that's really great, but I'm not going to spend the $3 a pound. I'll go to Walmart and buy the crap pink slime or whatever they, they serve there. You know, it's uh, just change comes with action and you have to take action Otherwise, you just wasted your time listening to me for an hour. So look at this. <clears throat> I took this photo when my cow herd came in from Gabe Brown. I put them in there just to make sure everybody had had a long ride. Everybody was doing all right. And it just hit me. You know what? In the background there, that grain setup, that's the old paradigm of agriculture. Commodity, centralized, and industrialized. I'm exporting grain all over the world. In the foreground is the new paradigm of agriculture, raising it on your land and selling it to your community. And I realized the only difference between the old paradigm and the new paradigm of agriculture is simply doing the work. you got to do to make this happen. And with that, remember people who say it cannot be done should not interrupt those who are doing it. One of my favorite quotes. Hope you'll stay in touch. Uh, here's some of the companies and teams I've had the opportunity to be a part of. Uh, one of the things on there that you'll be most interested in is the Ag Emerge podcast. Tune in. Uh, we've got 139, 140 episodes so far. We've been doing it for about four years before podcasts were super cool. We've had some amazing minds on there you can learn a lot from. If you want to see what we're doing at a direct-to-consumer business and copy us, go for it. Great. What a compliment. You know, I hope you do it. Uh, ASN, that's our wholesale business. We do a lot of research and product development there, and we support individual dealers. California Ag Solutions is an individual dealer that we started there 20 years ago in California. Then, of course, there's our farm. Website's terrible. Hasn't been updated for probably six or seven years. Need to do that. But anyway, uh, Ag Emerge, uh, tune in and uh, uh, listen and, and make a change on your farm. So, Anyway, uh, I'm going to go ahead and if you need to take a screenshot of that, you do that because it's just about to disappear. And I'm going to close this down so that we can go ahead and um, take some questions. Amber, I'll let you uh, I'll let you do that. Awesome. Thank you so much for that, Monty. That was that was great. Um, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat yet, um, but anyone feel free to put some in. I've got a couple questions. Um, 
Oh man, see, she had the questions ready just in case. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, awesome. Yes. Are you seeing? Are you seeing my um screen now? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, I might have missed this. Maybe you covered this right off in the beginning. But the no fence system does it work where there is no Wi-Fi or cell service? Yes, I would say um, if you're in the sand hills of Nebraska, probably not the ideal thing for you. I think um, the system, because each collar is individual cellular, uh, if you get into very large herds, uh, so let's say two or 300 or greater, probably one that where you spend the money on a $20,000 tower and put it up yourself and all that is probably the better fit. Um, you know, the smaller herds works great. Uh, the cell service, it's really interesting because um, it uses GSM, which is a global standard for cellular. And where I'm at, I can't get a GSM-based cell phone to work worth a darn. So it was, I was really concerned about that. And um, I haven't had any issues with it. Connectivity is awesome. So it, it uses a different bandwidth that has longer range. So... You know, it's one of those things that, um, you know, I was for sure it wouldn't work and it did. So it's just have to try and see. All right. Um, Jeremy asks um, if the system can be used for both large and small ruminants. And I, I think the answer is yes, but also yeah. can you pasture them together? You set up different pastures nope, for you them on the same system? No, you can you can run a flirt if you'd like to. Uh, that's that's not an issue. Um, or you could do them separate. Here's um, here's one thing I did, Jeremy. That was really interesting. Is I didn't have enough collars because they're still you know in the issue of um, making them uh, available, right? Supply chain shortages and all that. So I had about 100 collars. So I put the collars on my cows, and yet I use poly wire for my fats. So I had the fats, uh, let's say I, I gave uh, the paddock size was six acres, as an example. The cows were restricted to the uh, lat yesterday's three acres, okay? And the fats had today's three acres of fresh feed. So the, the calves would go up with the fats, but the water was sitting in the, the rear three acres. So um, the fats would walk back to the water through the cows and then go back up to the front but the virtual fence, even in a mixed herd, I could separate out um, the animals, uh, which I thought was very interesting uh, that that works. So anyway, I, I think that's interesting. You do the same thing with the flock is what I'm getting at is you could have the cows have access to everything and sheep access to only half of it or do a lead follow type of arrangement. Perfect. Another question we have is what kind of field signage identifying virtual fence do you use? I didn't see a lot of roadways in your maps. So do you have many neighbors? Okay. Uh, how do you handle new yeah, issues, stray dogs, wildlife, any of that stuff? Right. Uh, I see that question there. So first off, field signage. Uh, currently, what we're doing is we still run a perimeter fence uh, just because if I didn't, you know, invariably you get a call from the sheriff saying, hey, the cows are out. You know, so you have a virtual fence there uh, or a physical fence on the perimeter. Uh, and I use the virtual for subdividing. Um, neighbor issues would be uh, regards to if you didn't have that perimeter fence, I would assume. Now, stray dogs, um, you know, when you're dealing with um, when you're dealing with cattle, not an issue. Um, our cows are the way we raise them and train them. Um, we have a lot of coyote pressure here. So we have a couple packs of coyotes on both sides of us. So uh, I would feel sorry for the coyote that would try to come into our herd. The moms would kill them. That's just all there is to it. They're, they're very motherly. Uh, wildlife issues, actually better. I have problems with deer that just love to tear down poly wire, especially when it gets in the rut season. Holy smokes, they can, they can wrap a wire around their um, horns, uh, antlers, no problem. So um, it's actually better on the wildlife. Now, as far as in small ruminants getting attacked by um, 
uh, coyotes and predators and such. We currently have been training our dogs on the virtual fencing too. And we have two livestock guardian dogs with a goat herd of 45 inside of Polynet. Now, when that, um, when I have more of those collars available, I intend to put the collars on the goats and we intend to then have them with no Polynet in the timber, in the presence of coyotes. So we have uh, two Anatolians that are, um, I think if you get the two or three, you can do that without a problem. So anyway, uh, really next awesome. question there, uh, covered by equip. Do you know what the cost share is? Is it per collar? I think it's a matter of when you're putting together a grazing plan, a 528, you say, uh, Hey, I want to go to manage grazing and this is what it's going to cost. And this is the tools I'm going to use. So instead of submitting Gallagher reels and step in posts and all those kind of things, you can submit that and, and unfortunately, at this moment in time, it's a case-by-case -case basis. So if you're lucky and have a county person who's um, excited and equipped uh, to do these things, then you're probably in good luck. Uh, if you have one like other people do, <clears throat> um, they probably would be less excited about these things. So that's going to be more a county-by-county -county basis at the beginning. However, there's a lot of push at the state level in Indiana to get it done. And I think the USDA level will have a uniform thing here within the next year would be my guess. Nice. Um, another question I had is a, a lot of the folks who are grazing in our state use laneways or, you know, they're crossing roads or um, crossing driveways. How close can yep. you put the perimeters and how does that work in the grand scheme of things? Yeah, and when you're looking at a dairy where you're taking from the paddock to the milk barn and back, um, what you could do is you could set up the lane um, as part of that virtual fence boundary, and you'd want to make the lane, uh, the virtual boundary, a little bit wider than the physical fence, just so if there's any sort of GPS drift, you know, that it's a phenomenon that they can be three feet off or so, um, so that way they're not getting a tone for going where they're supposed to. Um, uh, I've actually planned to, I have got a move scheduled this uh, summer. I, I plan to set the boundary on both sides of the road banks of a road and move the herd down the road instead of trailering them. So they're going to have some fun and, you know, ask some of our customers that have horses and everybody to come out. We'll do a, you know, whole barbecue and, you know, cattle drive you know but with virtual fence where hopefully nothing can go wrong so we'll, <laughs> but we'll see uh you know it, it can be used for some things like that uh, and w which is which is really helpful and it's really good for uh it'd be lower stress than putting an animal uh, you know in a trailer and hauling her um and on your your cow calf operations you don't have collars on the calves just on the dams? If I, right, it, yes, when they're nursing, it's just on the dams. Um, that's, that's a good point. And, uh, but again, we're using perimeter and, and plus you can't put an ear tag, you know, on a calf and put a collar on a calf and e expect her to know what, what that is on day one. So, um, you know, I just put them on the 10 month olds and I've been watching notifications and I just did their first training line yesterday. And, uh, oh man, I was blowing up with alerts on, on that. Now today I can tell the alerts are half of, or a third of what they were yesterday. So they're learning and, uh, um, at, even at 10 months old. So I was, I was pretty excited about that. I, I think one of the things I'm trying to learn is, you know, uh, if you get in stalker, I think stalkers on cover crops is a great way to bring livestock back to the land without having to, you know, sell direct and all that jazz. So can we bring in weans, uh, train them on virtual fence collars and then put them out on cover crops. And I think that's a millions of acres application that, that, uh, row crop farmers could do. So I'm trying to investigate if that work, but yeah, long-term I'd like to have collars on everybody. I only have so many that work right now. Uh, they're talking full commercial release in 2025 here. So I'll be able to get more then. 
Um, um, good questions. Do you, I've got two more. <laughs> good. Do you expect to, or is there a technical service or support base for this system? Yeah, they, they open an office in uh, Madison, Wisconsin. And uh, Megan Filbert is uh, basically uh, heads up the U.S. implementation part of the No Fence. And she was the ruminant specialist at Practical Farmers of Iowa, which is a very large uh, farmer-led organization. So uh, that and uh, many things are just on the app that show you how to train and set them and maintain them and all that jazz. So it's... Uh, it's pretty easy. If you're doing polywire already, um, you'll pick this up real quick. Like then the cool part is you all of a sudden you start thinking of all the things you can do with them and you just, yeah. it's mind blowing. All right. Uh, last question I have, but if anyone else has questions, they can still pop them into the chat. Um, can you speak to uh, both the minimum and maximum animals and acreage that this system is applicable for? Well, I think because you have a cost per animal um, situation, um, and if you look at some of the other virtual fencing technologies, they have a, the cellular portion and the GPS portion adds a lot of cost into that framework. So when, when you've got something that uses a radio tower and you have maybe a hundred dollar per head collar but you have a twenty thousand uh, dollar base station you know if you have five animals that math don't work but if you have five thousand animals that math definitely does work so uh you know i advised them when they're asking me how to approach this i said basically you just focus on anything east of the missouri river and anything west of the sierra nevada and that's where you're going to find the, the, the cell coverage and the smaller herds uh, and uh, just stay out of the Great Plains. It's not your play and, and, and work. And then anytime you can work in a dairy, that's fantastic as a higher value animal. So I think, uh, you know, in the Northeast, this is a fantastic, um, fantastic opportunity. And because of the differences in the bands that it's using for cellular coverage, the trees don't, don't, uh, negate cell coverage as much. So I think that's a, that's a great opportunity. So anyway, I hope that answered your questions. They're great questions. Yeah. yeah, I think I don't see any more questions. Um, thanks so much, Monty, for, for joining us today. We really appreciate your time. Um, and for everybody else, we will be back here on Monday, March 25th at noon with Damian Goldring from Consumer Physics to talk about all things Sio Cup. Um, so we hope to see you then. Thanks so much. All right, thank you.